Not only do we have to keep the bad guys out of our network, we also have to keep them out of our buildings. So we use the same security fundamentals. We have authentication, authorization, and accounting that we do for the people that come into and leave our buildings. These are usually security zones that are well-defined. There may be a lobby, and that security zone may just be in the perimeter. Maybe outside of our building has a different security zone. And there may be sections inside of our organization that are public, restricted, secure, may have different types of security requirements associated with them. So we may be setting up different zones that have different types of physical security associated with those. We usually separate zones with a barrier of some kind. There is a wall. There's a door. There's a process you have to go through. Sometimes there is a physical guard in place to make sure the only people getting into that security zone are the ones that are authorized to be in that area of your building. It's very common for the security professionals to take a blueprint of the building, start dividing off the section, start creating different areas and different zones, and building in the type of things that they'll need. They may need a card reader in one section. Maybe a certain door has to be guarded by a physical guard. And that way, you're able to create different areas of the organization where you might put cameras, where you might put different door pads, where certain areas may be completely open. And as long as you are defining these very clearly on your blueprint, you'll have a very nice system in place to help with the physical security. We have many different options these days for physically locking a door. We can have, of course, the traditional lock and key. It's a very low secure type system, but it's one that's very easy and very inexpensive to implement. These days, you might also want to add on things like deadbolts. If you really want to protect some systems, maybe you need to add a little additional hardware onto that door to make sure nobody's getting in. These days, we have a lot of options. From an electronic perspective, we may be using things like keyless entry, where you have a badge, you'd scan a badge. Maybe you're typing in numbers, and that keyless entry doesn't require a key. You simply type in the secret numbers, and you're allowed access into the room. It could also be token-based. Those cards that we carry around have these small chips inside of them, these little tokens. So we may have a proximity reader, or we may be physically swiping a card like we have with our credit cards to be able to gain access. So it may be a magnetic strip that's on those token-based hardware locks. And of course, we do have biometrics available as well. Maybe you have to put your hand on a sensor. Maybe you have to use your eyes to be able to gain access to a particular secure area. It's an absolutely viable way of protecting these very, very high secure areas in your environment. And sometimes you have to do multiples of these. Maybe you not only have to scan your finger in a biometric reader, but then you also have to type in your secret code into the keys so that you're able to gain access into that secure area. Very secure areas like financial organization data centers or data centers that are very, very large, maybe access points for the internet, will have things like man traps inside of them. These man traps are restrictions to allow or disallow access to the area. And usually these man traps put you in a holding area so that you first have to walk through a system be validated, and then you're able to continue through in the other area. Man traps can be set up to work many different ways. Maybe all doors are normally unlocked. And if you uh, go through one door, it causes everything else to lock until you're approved to go through the separate door. Maybe all doors are normally locked. And if you unlock one of the doors, none of the others can be unlocked. So that restricts people from coming in while you're inside of the man trap. And of course, it may be a system where one door is locked and the other is unlocked. So when one is open, the other can't be unlocked. So the man traps themselves can be set up in a number of different ways. And it, it just depends on how your organization is about restricting access to and from certain areas inside of your environment. Video surveillance used to be very, very costly. But the costs of doing this have dropped dramatically, especially now that these are all network systems. All We don't have tapes and separate units. We're all doing this digitally and storing that information on a disk. It becomes very, very easy to deploy video systems in your environment. And if these are video systems that you're using, you'll sometimes hear them referred to as closed circuit television or CCTV. That way, you don't have to have somebody physically watching a corridor or physically watching access to a room. Not only are you able to see that in real time, but you're also able to store that information for later. 
You also have to look at the properties of these cameras. So when you're putting one for a parking lot that might be outside and you might want to monitor it in the dark, that's different than you're, if you're in a well-lit corridor. So you want to think about focal length, where you have wider angles and you're able to see a lot more information from a single camera. Maybe you want to consider depth of field, which considers how much of that area is in focus. If you're only looking at a door, you may not need a lot of depth of field. If you're looking at a parking lot, you may want that entire parking lot to be in focus. And illumination requirements. Can your cameras see when the light level gets very, very low? Or do they have infrared capabilities to be able to see additional information in the dark? You have to put the right camera in the right place for what you're doing. There are often many different kinds of cameras deployed. They're all networked together. You're recording this information over time. And it really gives you a lot of flexibility if you ever need to go back and find out who went into a door, who had access to that area, and you're able to see all of that pulled directly from disk. There's a proverb that says that fences make good neighbors. And I don't know how true that is, but fences certainly make for good security. In our environments, we generally need some type of perimeter around our organization. And this fence may be one that is very, very obvious. Sometimes it's not obvious. It depends on your requirements for this. I have literally been to data centers that had moats around them. You could even consider that a type of fence, but it's not something that's obvious as you're driving by. You don't even see that there's no way to drive up to that building unless you go over this one driveway into that data center. So it may be that you're building a perimeter and it's all chain link fence. That obviously looks a little bit different. Maybe it, it acts as a deterrent for people who would ever consider going onto your property. From a security perspective, you want a fence that's generally transparent. You want to be able to see the people coming. You want to be able to have it so that you have a barrier up, but it's one that you can see through. You also might want to consider one that is very robust. You don't want people being able to come up to the fence and cut through it. Maybe your fence is one that is iron instead of chain chain link fence. And that's a consideration you have to put in place when you're building out your security posture and how secure you want to be and what you want that fence to do for you. You also want to make sure that people can't climb over the fence. So generally, you'll see fences with razor wire at the top, or maybe the fence itself is very, very high. All of these types of physical controls can make sure that people are not entering your facility that you don't want to be there.